The Databases for Machine Learning and Machine Learning for Databases seminar series at Carnegie Mellon University is recorded in front of a live studio audience. Funding for this program is made possible by Google and from contributions from viewers like you. Thank you. Awesome, guys. Thanks for everyone coming. Uh, it's a new semester, so we're, we're excited to have uh, kick off the new seminar series. So this semester, we're doing machine learning for databases and databases for, for machine learning. Um, in retrospect, maybe I should have called it for AI for databases because that's more buzzwordy. Uh, but nevertheless, the goal is to discuss various systems that are facilitating machine learning AI workloads and then using AI and machine learning to improve database systems. So we're excited today to have Andre Vassenstoff, uh, who is the CTO and co-founder of Quadrant, one of the hot uh, vector search engine vector databases in this, this space. So he's here today to talk about the internals of their system. So for people that are joining us for the first time, uh, the way we want to do this is that we don't want Andre to talk to himself for an hour in Zoom, because that's not fun. Um, so if you have questions as we go along, please unmute yourself, say who you are, and, and ask a question at any time. We want this to be interactive for him and not just, again, speaking to the void for an hour. And again, we'd like to thank Google also, too, for sponsoring us again this, uh, this semester. So if you're not able to un uh, unmute yourself, you can Poke, uh, send a message in chat and I'll I'll try to stop and uh, ask it. Okay. All right, Andre, thank you so much for, for kicking us off in the new semester. Uh, it's always a good turnout. So uh, the floor is yours. Please go for it. Yeah. Thank you, Andy. And yeah, thank you for having me here. I am Andre Vasenso. I'm co-founder and CTO at Quadrant. I started Quadrant as a pet project about three years ago basically to solve my own problems at my day job, which later turned into a dedicated company. And that's what I'm doing now for full time. Um, all code in Quadrant goes through my reviews. So you can assume I know it pretty well. Um, I work in the search related fields for already almost 10 years. I started my career as a backend engineer at a web scale search project much similar to what Google does. Um, I was working on very low level components of the search engine, like indexing and storage. Later, I switched to more high level components like uh, query parsing and ranking. You know, in, uh, used a lot of machine learning in my job. Uh, and at some point, we started to use uh, vector search in our projects. and. Uh, and that's that's basically where I got the idea to build a search engine which is specialized on, on vector similarity. So what is Quadrant actually? Quadrant is a vector similarity search engine, or as our marketing department make me also call it a vector database. But personally, I don't really like the term vector database and prefer search engine as a more accurate one. And I hope in this presentation, I will be able to explain why exactly I think so. Uh, Quadrant is fully open source. It's distributed uh, under Apache 2.0 license. We have more than 60 external contributors on GitHub. And uh, yeah, please, uh, you're welcome to contribute in Quadrant as well. Quadrant is written in, in Rust, as I think all system level software should be. But yeah, that's a topic for another talk. As for this talk, uh, I propose to cover the following things. First, it's short but mandatory introduction into what vector search actually is uh, and what quadrant plays, like which role quadrants plays in, in all of this industry. Uh, second is uh, architectural overview of quadrant, how how it works uh, on a general level, general idea. Uh, and I also wanted to clear some terms before we go uh, deeper into, into vector specifics. Yeah, and the third topic is, is especially this uh, vector specifics. Uh, so um, what, what makes uh, vector databases or vector search engines uh, special? What challenges we faced and how we solve them? And yeah, which uh, technical decisions we made uh, in this process. Yeah, but let's start this uh, first um, overview of what, what vector search is. 
uh, as, a, as an approach, vector search is, is not new. It was used by many big companies for quite a long time. And principle didn't change much since then. The basic idea is that you have some model, or we also call it an encoder. Uh, typically, it's a neural network. Uh, it can convert some input data into a dense vector representation. And those vector representations, or we also call them embeddings, uh, they have very interesting property. A pair of vectors in vector space, which are close to each other, is usually corresponding to objects which are also similar in some sense. Uh, in, in case of texts, it could be a, a similarity of the meaning. In case of images, it can be visual similarity and, and so on. And uh, it's actually defined by the model, which type of similarity we want to catch with, with those embeddings. And also distance function between vectors is also defined by the model, but in ma majority of use cases, it's just a simple dot production between vectors. So all of this is not new. What is new is how uh, available those ready to use models become and tools around them have become to a wide audience. So now anybody can go and download a pre-trained model and use it without any knowledge of machine learning. Um, so the next logical step actually is to bring this technology to production levels. So not just scientists, but also engineers and software developers can, can work with it. Uh, the next step is to provide the level of uh, convenience and reliability uh, as it exists in such familiar tools like text and search engines, like traditional databases, and bring this convenience into, into the vector search world. And that's what actually, yeah, we, we do it in Quadrant. So let's uh, now take a look at how, how Quadrant actually achieved this. So here's the top level overview of Quadrant components. Uh, each level in this hierarchy is represents some special kind of isolation. Uh, on the top level, it's a collection. Collection logically isolates types of data between each other. Uh, it's similar to table in relational databases or collectional collections in, in, in document databases like, like MongoDB, for example. After, after collection, it goes the next uh, step, which is shards. Shards isolate subset of data uh, between each other. It is guaranteed that shard contain only non-overlapping subset of records. And shard can be moved between nodes. Shards can be replicated for higher availability and so on. Um, and finally, the lowest uh, uh, level of uh, isolation is segment. Segment isolates index and data storage. So each, state, each segment is capable of performing all the same operations as a whole collection on its own, but just on a smaller subset of data. Uh, and yeah, later I explain why exactly do we need segments and, and how they work. But before that, um, a bit more about uh, top level. So you may notice that on the top level, quadrant architecture is, is pretty standard. Uh, we have collections which contain shards. shards. Shards can be replicated and moved around nodes. Uh, we use a uh, raft consensus protocol to keep track on this metadata, like where collections are located. Where, what is the node status, what is the collection configuration, and so on. So all of this uh, metadata is stored in the distributed consensus way. Um, and it's also like, pretty standard for, for many uh, distributed systems. What uh, and, and this is actually because Quadrant is a typical example of a system built on base principles. And base here stands for basically available soft state, eventual consistency. Uh, it is typically uh, compared with ACID principles, which are more common to, to relational databases. So if you want to have uh, an intuitive understanding of what is base and what is ACID, you can think about Postgres and Elasticsearch. So Postgres is a typical example of ACID database. It has um, very strict uh, transactional guarantees. It cares a lot about consistency of the data, but the scalability of Postgres is actually very limited. It's basically up to the size of the single machine. Uh, on the other hand, 
Elasticsearch is a typical example of base system. It is highly scalable, but consistency guarantees are much weaker. And that's actually why I prefer the term vector search engine rather than vector database. And for systems like Quadrant, uh, scalability and performance, in my opinion, is much more important than uh, transactional consistency. So it should be treated as a search engine rather than database. Ideally, I, I think it should not be even used as a primary storage of data, especially considering that uh, the full update of vectors, like due to, for example, a new version of the model is, is just a common operation in, in vector database world. So you, you need to write the whole, uh, whole database and create a new one just because your um, encoder has changed, right? And it, it's something which never happens in uh, traditional databases. Okay. Yeah, so what happens inside the chart is a bit more interesting for this talk because it is actually have uh, specifics related to vector search. Uh, on the top level, we see a pretty standard component, uh, right ahead lock, which is responsible uh, that, uh, for, for the fact that Quadrant doesn't usually lose data once it's committed. Uh, yeah, again, it's, it's a pretty standard component for, for any database. Uh, what is not standard is the second level of data segregation inside the shard. And this, this second level is segments. So why do we need many segments in the first place? Yeah, wh why can't we put just the old data into one segment and that's it? Uh, and there, there are actually reasons for this. Uh, first reason is mutability. Uh, and in Quadrant, we actually love immutable data structures. The simple assumption that structure is only built once and then never extended actually opens room for many different optimizations. Data structure can become more compact. We do not need to jump between different locations in memory, therefore less cache misses. All data is uh, all data statistics is is known in advance. So based on that, we can perform various optimizations as well. Like for example, we can pre-compute histograms, we can pre-compute uh, data distributions, um, and, and so on. Of course, in this case, we can also uh, allocate the exact amount of memory we need, so we don't need to worry about memory fragmentation as well. Uh, loading immutable data structures is also much faster because you don't need to perform any kind of deserialization. You just copy a raw chunk of memory from disk, and that's it or you can even do memory mapping, it's even faster. Uh, on top of that, we can uh, further compress data using such techniques as, as delta encoding, as variable byte encoding, and so on. And this total effect, total combined effect of this optimization can be, uh, like can make immutable data structures um, order of magnitude more efficient than mutable ones. Yeah, the second reason actually is, um, trade-off between latency and throughput. And the reason for this is that uh, concurrency of the single request is only efficient to a certain point. And the closer we are getting to low-level index, the less efficient concurrency becomes. So that makes segment a, a natural unit of parallelization in Quadrant. For example, if we are dealing with an application which requires a very low latency for a single request, we can optimize CPU utilization by just assigning uh, each CPU core with, with one segment. And this, in this way, it will utilize as much CPU as possible in just one request. On the other hand, if we have an application which is dealing with high throughput uh, and it requires to, to make a lot of parallel requests, we can have a single large segment. And in this case, it will maximize the throughput of the whole system by just uh, serving each request on, on, on a dedicated core using the whole segment in, in read mode. So we have a question from Rohan asking, what is the, what is the segment size? Uh, any. So you said any? Any, okay. any, any size. Like what, it's what, only, is, what, what is the default then for you guys? Default is zero. Like, <laughs> if you don't have any data, 
it's zero. If you put some data in there, it's uh, it's growing to 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 the extent where. It, well, what we what we prefer to configure is not the size of segment, but how many segments we want to have on your machine. Okay. And and you can go as as big as you want if you have enough resources for this. So so can so according to this logic, so suppose you have n number of segments. What you're trying to say is that's the max. There could be all storage utilized by one se one segment itself. That can happen. It, it is possible, yes. If if you want, uh, if your application is very read heavy, if you ha have very low amount of uh, write requests, and and you prefer to maximize your like throughput, yes, it's possible to uh, just join all data into one segment and you know, work with this. Okay, thank you. Uh, somebody else, next question. Uh, is there any advantage yeah. to having segments of different sizes within the same shard or collection? Right. Uh, so there is no advantage in, in this because we prefer to have uh, like uh, even distribution. But in practice, it may happen because uh, segments are joined like during the insertion of data, segments are, can be joined together uh, and you always need to have at least one segment which is not immutable, where we can put new information into. So in practice, it's not not happening, but we prefer to have them as even as possible. Any other questions? So Somebody asks, is the segment sizing configurable at runtime? Size, no. The amount of segments, yes. Let's keep it going because let's get to the actual vector part. All right. Well, there is one slide about segment management, though. So the thing is, we have a lot of segments within this chart, and some of them are immutable, others are just used to insert a new data. But uh, how do we maintain the illusion for the user that actually the, the whole collection is fully mutable and in quadrant user actually can insert, delete, update any data at any time. Um, so ideally, we, users should not even know that this segment exists. It's pure internal thing. Uh, and in order to solve this problem, we uh, need to actually solve two problems. The first is how to update data in immutable data structure. And second is how to even obtain the immutable data structure in the first place. So the first problem is solved by simply employing a copy and write mechanism. So whenever a user inserts a new data into or changes data in, in the immutable segment, we just copy this uh, piece of data into a mutable segment, mark it is a, as a deleted in the old segment, and yeah, everything works. Uh, the second problem is a bit more complicated because we need to perform long-running optimizations on a segment. So index building is, is quite long. That's why we need to keep the segment available for read and updates for the user. At the same time, we need to build index from it. And in order to do it, we use a so-called proxy segment, which is a special type of segment that wraps in one under one interface, the segment which is currently being optimized. Uh, and uh, it also holds a list of modifications it needs to apply to resolve a conflicts which is happening when you copy data from uh, old segment into, into a new one. There's like special data structure which manages all these insertions. And when optimization is done, it just uh, converts back into uh, into just regular segment, into pair of segments, actually, into optimized one and into a small copy and write segment, which just becomes a, a mutable segment. Uh, yeah, inside segment, it's uh, th there are some bunch of uh, abstract components. I intentionally am not going to describe how exactly each of them works on a low level. Instead, I will focus on vector index, mainly. And the reason for this is that the choice of concrete implementation is just depends on configuration. For example, 
vector storage, we have at least three different implementations of vector storage in Quadrant. And it's quite possible that in, in recent future, we will add the fourth one. And yeah, it's it's not really important. The Quadrant works, able to work with like any abstractions. It can be uh, just files, it can be memory storage and so on. Doesn't really matter. But this uh, matter is vector index. Uh, and let's finally talk about the main component of the vector search. Uh, the, the vector index, there are two main traits that distinguish vector search from traditional indexes like inverted index or P3 or stuff like this. First, it's approximate nature. Uh, it's uh, It says that uh, it, it does not guarantee that the result will be exact or even that the result will be the same for the same underlying data if you build the index multiple times because the, the result actually depends on the order in which you insert data into the index. So it's uh, quite fundamental. And the second is uh, that any vector can be result of any search request. In other words, any documents in your collection is somewhat similar to any other document in your collection. So it's in, impossible to draw a clear line between relevant and irrelevant documents based solely on, on the vector similarity score. And of course, there are a lot of different approaches how to implement vector index, but no matter which approach you choose, uh, all of them will have uh, to deal with these properties I just described. And actually, it breaks many assumptions you made uh, in the traditional databases. And therefore, I believe it actually requires a special treatment and special uh, dedicated architecture around it. Uh, in Quadrant, we use uh, so-called HNSW index. Here, HNSW stands for Hierarchical Navigable Small World. But yeah, it's a pretty complicated uh, name, but I will try to explain uh, it in, in a very simplified version of it, just, uh, just to provide some intuition about how it works. So internally, HNSW appears as a proximity graph. That means that each vector is represented as a node in a graph, and those nodes are connected with some number of closest neighbors, so some number of other vectors in the database. And search in the proximity graph is performed in greedy manner, meaning that on each step, we choose the closest node to the target, and then repeat the search step with, with this new selected node. The process is repeated until we can no longer improve the distance between node and the target. And um, of course, there are no guarantees that this search will result in the absolute closest vector. That's why it's called approximate. Uh, but we can control the precision uh, and we can trade off precision and, and, and speed of the search by changing the beam size parameter of the search. Yeah, but uh, of course, uh, HNSW index brings its own challenges. First of all, building time. Uh, insertion of, of a new vector into, into the index is approximately two times more expensive than just searching the index. And it's also very CPU intensive on its own. Therefore, if we do want to index uh, and do not affect our other processes. Like if, you, if we do index and search at the same time, it's necessary to have a dedicated thread pool just for building index in the background. Or ideally, we might even want to move this uh, index building process into another machine like completely. Uh, HNSW index is not only CPU intensive, but it also uh, have a random data access pattern. That means that on every um, that means every uh, it's very it's very uh, sensitive to the latency of of the underlying storage, and techniques like prefetching, like block reading, are not not really efficient with uh, 
uh, these engines double. That's why it's usually uh, it requires a lot of RAM and doesn't really work with this disk. And, and moreover, uh, read pattern is not only random, but it's also sequential. Remember, we go from one node in the graph to another. That means that we cannot we cannot do efficient parallelization of the search, and its performance is mostly limited by the latency of the storage rather than throughput. To overcome these uh, challenges, in Quadrant, we do the following thing. So a solution is to use a compressed memory representation of vectors and use it to generate selection of candidates. For instance, one of the latest addition to the quadrant engine is binary quantization. It allows us to compress vector to a level where a single dimension is represented by just a single bit, which gives a total of 32 times compression for the vector. And on top of that, it allows us to use very fast CPU. Like basically, it allows us to compare vector in just two CPU instructions bitwise XOR and pop count. Uh, and it works especially efficient with large vectors, like the one which provided with uh, open AI models, for example, where we have 1,500 dimensions for a single vector. Uh, yeah, after obtaining this list of candidates, we can rescore them using the original vector and return the final result to user. And it's, it's, it's important to know that uh, this rescoring process, unlike traversal of the HNSW graph, can be actually can be efficiently parallelized, uh, as we already know all the offsets, all the IDs of candidates. So we can leverage here the asynchronous I/O and take advantage even of the slow network mounted disks with, with huge latency. So you said you said rescoring. So like you take the quantized quantized vectors, and then you sh then what do you do it against the original vectors again? Right. So we do search like we do a usual search using HNSW using quantized representation. So it's very fast, uh, very memory efficient. And then uh, after we obtain like let's say top one hundred results, we do rescoring using original representation. We, we do yeah. need to fetch those 100 vectors from disk, but uh, while we do this, we, we know all the offsets. So we just make a parallel request to disk with asynchronous I.O. or something like this, and, and just get all the all the original vectors pretty fast. As, yeah, so you're, you're compressing the, the vectors into the quantized form. That makes the index look faster, but you still have to do the final comparison to see whether it's, what the true ranking should be. All right, there's a right. bunch of questions in the... Uh, in the chat. So the first question, is this equivalent to what disk ANN does? Um, I don't know what that is, but I'm assuming it's- uh, Yeah, disk ANN is a bit different. So I don't I don't think disk ANN does any kind of quantization. There are other implementation which does. So I, I don't think this approach is, uh, is somewhat like revolutionary. Um, but yeah, it's it's packed into into the box where you can use it without any additional configuration. You don't need to uh, pre-quantize your data, your vectors. You just upload everything in Quadrant, and it just works out of the box. So Quadrant takes care of this quantization itself. It takes care about uh, rescoring, and yeah, you get the result. I right, see. So the next question we'll hold off to the end. They're asking basically how many vectors can you put on a single box. Well, that, that's an arbitrary question. We'll, we'll come back to that later. Keep going. Yeah. All right. So another challenge is which is associated with HNSW is a requirement to combine vector search with additional filtering conditions. Uh, for example, you might want to search for some kind of item in e-commerce store and the price of this item should be less than hundred dollars, and and we want to search it on a specific location, like near you, find something near me, some stuff like this. So those additional conditions uh, are really necessary for real world applications, but vanilla implementation of HNSW or any other uh, NN algorithm just doesn't have this. 
And in some publication, you might find that there are two ways to solve this problem. It's either post-filtering or pre-filtering. In post-filtering, uh, it is suggested that we can perform a regular vector search and then apply filtering conditions later on top of the result and exclude those results that just do not match filtering criteria. Uh, we might need to repeat this process several times until we obtain the required number of results. Yeah, this approach is quite simple to implement, but unfortunately it's very inefficient, especially if uh, the filtering condition is very strict or if it's correlated with vector similarity score itself. So this approach basically risks to either turn this, the whole search into a linear scan or return incomplete results eventually. Another approach is, is other way around, uh, it suggests, I mean, I'm pre-filtering. It suggests to generate a list of candidates and based on this list of candidates, uh, we can perform a uh, vector search. And the problem with this is that uh, generating a list of candidates on its own might be a very expensive operation. Uh, worst case scenario, it might require to check condition for half of the vectors in the collection and it can uh, significantly increase the search latency on its own. So what we propose, an approach that is used in Quadrant, uh, we call in-place filtering. That means that filtering condition is checked during the graph traversal. It did require us to make some custom implementations, custom uh, adjustments to HNSW. So we don't use uh, vanilla implementation anymore. We, we use a custom implementation Quadrant. Uh, but in this way, we can ensure that we only need to check filtering conditions the uh, amount of times that you actually needed to perform the search. And like it, it looks like a problem solved, but yeah, unfortunately not. Um, the problem arises uh, when the filtering condition is so strict that the graph become disconnected. That means we cannot longer find the path between the entry point in the graph and the section uh, which actually contains the uh, desired results. And in mathematics, uh, there is a whole field of study called percolation theory, which is dedicated to this, spe this spe special type of problem. And for large random graphs, this theory actually gives a surprisingly simple equation that defines uh, how many nodes should be removed from the graph to make it disconnected. And equation is simply one over K, where K is the average number of connections per node inside the graph. In other words, let's say if we have uh, 10 connections per node, after removing 90% of nodes, the graph will become disconnected. And yeah, let's see how it <laughs> looks in practice. In practice, um, yeah, this plot shows the precision of the search in relation to the fraction of vectors being filtered out. And you can see that after a certain point, the accuracy drops almost, almost to zero. And there are several experiments which demonstrate that this effect actually depends on number of connections per node. Indeed, it's, it's very close to theory. Uh, so, what we can do about it? Well, to address this problem, we can leverage the fact that filters we want to apply to the search are, are not actually random. In most cases, uh, these filters are based on some metadata or payload associated with vectors. As you can remember, we have a price next to an item and we know price in advance. Uh, we know, and, and we not only know, know the price in advance, but we also know that uh, what price is associated with which vector on the index building stage, yeah, because we use immutable data structures. Uh, and what we can do is to build additional links that we can generate based on the existing payload values and possible filtering conditions. For example, if we have a payload with uh, a keyword field and we can build subgraph for each value of this field and then merge the subgraph 
for the keyword into, into the main one. And that's how we can create this additional links. And these links will ensure that when we apply a filtering condition with this keyword, our, our graph will always uh, stay connected. No matter how many, how stripped the, the search is, we can guarantee this. And this uh, approach- quick, uh, A quick clarifying yeah. question. On yeah. the non-vector components, that metadata, is the search right. on that guaranteed to be exact or is that also no. approximate? Yeah, if 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 you are talking um, about this type of yep. queries, the, yep. So it's a combination of uh, vector search and filtering. So you 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 are performing uh, approximate search within this condition. So it still stays approximate, but we can guarantee that the condition are uh, like satisfied. Got it. So at a high level, you're probably vectorizing those additional attributes itself and just creating a gigantic no, no, no. to index no, now. No, no, vector stays the same. We keep a uh, payload next to the vector. It's stored in the quadrant. We perform this uh, search. And on each step during the search, we check the condition. So we don't okay. go okay. into, into okay. those. We don't, don't go into those nodes which are filtered out. So it sounds a little bit like post filtering, right? You'll still do approximate nearest neighbor search following the HNSW graph on the vector and only on the additional metadata, you'll do an exact search. Am I getting that right? Uh, no, not exactly. Uh, the difference with post filtering is that we apply it not after we generate the candidates, but during the search. So in this case, we can guarantee that we will return exact amount of uh, results we request. And all of these results will satisfy the filtering condition because we restrain our search procedure with, with this condition and we do not let the search process go into area where the condition is not satisfied. Okay, thank you. Uh, right. Sorry, a quick uh, follow up on that, I guess. Uh, would quantization affect the filtering? Like, would, would we accidentally no. filter something no. that could have been satisfied if we had the uncompressed vector? No, no, quantization is uh, only affecting the precision. It may, it may affect the precision of uh, Vector search itself, filtering is completely untouched. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. Uh, any other questions so far? Okay. So uh, we were talking about building the additional links in the graph. Um, and, uh, and and yeah, so the thing, uh, the, the the good side of of this approach is that it doesn't actually increase search complexity. Even so, we increase the size of the graph. We can still perform the search only using the original original links where it's needed, and utilize extra links only when original links are being filtered out. So. The total complexity of the search is, is not affected. We can index as many additional links as we want. We can index many additional fields. Yeah, that's another point actually, is that uh, this approach is compatible with multiple fields being used for filtering at once, because uh, when we do that, we merge all the subgraphs into the main one and we basically can deduplicate um, links at this stage. So only a fraction of additional memory will be actually required for this. And um, yeah, and search, uh, search speed won't be, won't be affected. Uh, what matters, yeah. So Sid asks, does Quadrant to do any cardinality estimation to determine query plans? Yes. Or is it in place? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes, it does. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have slides for this, but I'm, I'm happy to answer those questions after after the main topic. Awesome. Thanks. I had a quick question. I was wondering if I had something like customer ID, where I know like 
those things are always going to be like separated out? Is there anything, would you recommend doing like different collections or is there something else to recommend right. based off of that? Right, it's, a, it's the most frequently ans- asked questions in our Discord community. By the way, feel free to join it. Uh, I'm as, as, uh, answering questions there as well. So what Quadrat can do is to build HNSW graph only based on payload. So we can skip building the, this whole main graph for all points and only build subgraphs for the specific user IDs. In this case, we can still have uh, search performance within user, right? Uh, it's all it's all be very fast. We can still have uh, a full scan ability to, to to look through the whole collection, and at the same time, we do not have to spend as much resources on building a vector index for, for all points altogether. So yeah, it's it's like a solution which allows you to do like semi segregation of data. They will be still stored in one collection, so no overhead for creating many collections, and uh, you 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 are able to perform searches on on a, on a sub uh, subsets of of your data. And Andre, feel free to defer this question if you're going to talk about it later. Are you going to describe what's the comp complexity of creating this HNSW index both as the number of records grow and as the dimensionality of each of the vector grows. Right. Uh, so I will start from, from the last question. Uh, dimensionality of a vector affects how fast you can compare a pair of vectors, right? So it is basically linear in this case. If you have, let's say, a thousand dimensions, it will be two times slower than 500 dimensions. Uh, complexity of uh, graph search itself and building of the graph is uh, like, there, there is no exact estimation for this, but you can say it's approximately logarithmic. Uh, and uh, the, the process of indexing actually involves search. So in order to insert a new data, you need to first search for its neighbors and then perform like uh, changes in the graph. So overall it's, yes, it, it's quite expensive to build large indexes. That's why yeah, that's, that's why there are some optimizations here that we're trying to do on, on this as well. Um, that's why you might want to have multiple shards and multiple segments. To, to limit this uh, overall size of the second. Yeah, that's a good point. And what uh, I've with what you just said, can these yeah. links cross across segments or shards? No. Sounds like not no. across shards, but across segments? No, no, these links are isolated to, to one segment. One segment. Okay, got it. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So what we, what we do uh, when we do a search, uh, we basically ask each segment in individually and then merge the result of the search. It's a similar approach, which is used in all other, uh, even text search engines. It's a pretty standard thing. Yeah, but yeah, <laughs> thank you for asking. Maybe it's not clear for, for somebody who's not deep into this topic. Um, yeah, so what one? Yeah. Oh, sorry, can I ask a question about um, searching across segments? Um, so I was wondering, are the segments just random are they based on like some sort of spatial partition so points in the segments are likely to be close to each other or like how is that approached right so in our implementation segments are completely random each time we insert the point we just toss a coin and, and put it into into first first segment which is appendable uh, we do not do any kind of clustering inside uh, mostly because the clustering actually de depends on type of vectors and it depends on model and we cannot make these assumptions in advance. It might be a good approach if you're building like a dedicated system for some application where you know which encoding model you're going to do, but for general purpose, it's, uh, yeah, unfortunately not, not really working. Uh, hi, sorry. 
uh yeah. how are these uh, expected filtering conditions determined are they predetermined in a sort of like prepared query fashion yeah so what we have uh in advance is we know what payload user uploaded into quadrant along with the vector so usually it's uh, it's in the form of just json document and user can specifically say which fields should be indexed. Like, let's say we have a product, like an e-commerce store, and we have a description, log text, description, name, price, and, and category tag, something like this. And it's usually only price and category tag are going to be used inside search filtering conditions. And that's why user can specify that those two fields should be indexed. And once they are indexed, we know that they should be included into this uh, process of building additional links in HSW. Cool. Thank you. Anything else? No. All right. So uh, one important thing uh, about this additional payload and uh, associated uh, payload indexes is that data type of payload does matter. Uh, but in most, it mo in most cases, it is possible to come up with a strategy to, to cover filtering condition with a subgraph. It's especially interesting where we are talking about, let's say, numerical field, where we don't have exactly a keyword which defines a strict subset of, of points. But in this case, we can, for example, what we do in Quadrant is we build a subgraph for overlapping intervals. We know that for some intervals, it, which, which interval how, covers how many points, and we know this minimal threshold of how many points should be in a graph. So we build overlapping intervals, and we uh, build this subgraphs, this additional links for those intervals. And also we can do the same with, uh, let's say, location data, where, he, where we have a geo coordinates, so latitude, longitude, we encode it into, into geo hashes and basically build um, these additional graphs for overlapping geo hash regions. And yeah, the result of this is that we can close uh, the gap in filtering precision from, from two sides. From one side, we close the gap by introducing these additional links. And from the other side, we increase the connectivity of the whole, whole graph. And in most practical use cases, the drop of precision is uh, not noticeable next to the fundamental approximate nature of HNSW itself. It is just like a noise and no signal. Well, actually it's uh, all topics I I have presentation for. Uh, just for those who, who just joined, here's a short summary of what I tried to cover. So first of all, uh, vector search is only getting started. I believe that uh, there are many more interesting use cases beyond, beyond just uh, text search or memory for chatbots. Um, second point is that Quadrant is a search engine and should be treated as such. Architecture of search engines is fundamentally different from the architecture of, of databases, and it should be taken into consideration when you are designing your own application. And finally, vector search index is, is a pretty specific component and it requires special treatment even for such usual operations as, as filtering. So what is out of scope of this presentation, but I'm happy to answer questions about it and uh, even beyond, beyond this talk is a query planning and payload indexes. How do we organize it uh, inside Quadrant. Uh, interesting topic is dynamic search limit 
per segment. So as I, as I mentioned, we have multiple segments uh, and in order to get the whole search result, we need to go into each segment and ask for some amount of results in each of them and then combine. But if we want to search for the uh, very large limit, it might be expensive to do. We have some optimization for this. And yeah, more on quantization. We currently support three versions of quantization. It's binary quantization, the most recent one, scalar quantization, product quantization. Well, we have all of this. Uh, yeah, that would be all. Thank you. And yeah, I'm happy to answer questions. Awesome. So I, I will applaud on behalf of everyone else. Uh, if you have any questions, can un unmute yourself. We have, we have about nine minutes left. Go for it. Uh, maybe I'll ask a question. Uh, Andre, that was a really nice talk. There are two different okay. ways which people are going about putting vector search in data-rich applications. One is where you start with some sort of a relational code like PG vectors and you put it in Postgres. The advantage there is that if your data application needs to search on these additional attributes, regular columns, you can get very deterministic semantics on the search for that type of metadata. And of course, the disadvantage is on the vector search, you can't build these quote unquote global like indices like HNSW. Do you have some thoughts on what kind of applications from your perspective fit which style of embedding vectors along with relational type of search? Or you think this approach, your way of doing it, or, th or do you think there might be one way that basically captures everything that will emerge? Right. Uh, so regarding Postgres and uh, relational databases, it's what I was talking about, difference between base and AC type of systems, right? So Postgres, as I mentioned, is, is a typical AC database. It have very strict uh, transaction guarantees. It have very strict uh, consistency, uh, but the scalability of Postgres is, is very limited at the same time. So in, in your application, you should decide what, what is the most important thing you want to do with your vectors. Well, probably vector search and vector database is not a good choice if you are building some kind of banking system where you have money transfer, right? At the same time, uh, uh, maybe Elasticsearch Andrew, is, maybe is I'll clarify my question. If I have an application yeah. in which I need to do both relational search and vector search in the same application. Uh, well, if you, if you, uh, by relational search, you mean some kind of joins? And... Yeah, join, not even joins. Imagine I have a big table. I want to search on different columns in different ways, depending upon the user query. And I've got a vector column that is part of that search. So my search may involve find everything where the student ID is in this range, the age is in this range. And then there is some uh, vector representation of maybe some some descriptive stuff about them. I also want to search on this. I want to mix exact search and approximate search together in my end application. Well, yeah, that's what exactly uh, this filterable queries are doing in, in Quadrant. And well, the answer for this is depends if you are satisfied with uh, scalability limits, which is uh, which exists in Postgres. In, in most cases, I think Postgres will do just a full scan if, if you try to combine um, this relational filters and uh, uh, semantic component. So if, if you are satisfied with uh, scalability of Postgres, yeah, you, you can do that. But also I mentioned that uh, search engines are rarely the uh, source of truth in your, in your system. So what usually happens is you, are, you have your Postgres and you also have uh, some additional indexing engines. You can have Elasticsearch for text. You can have Quadrant for, for vector search, which do not hold like the uh, may, maybe even very up to date data, but they can perform the specific types of queries very very fast and and scalable, and and you can still have Postgres in your system as well. So it's not uh, like excluding each other. Thank you.
All right, uh, Avery, you want to ask a question or? Yeah, <clears throat> actually, so I was curious about this uh, additional of addition of new links things. Like, uh, how do you decide how many new links to add? And also in practice, how much does this blow up the graph? I was kind of curious if you have seen any predicate that is any attribute that's even relatively had like you know had hundred values. Let's say you would end up adding a lot of uh, new right. edges, right? In order to make right. it work. Yeah. So. Uh... So let's say okay. he's hi he's hiding his name, but that's a a, a mold Dishpandi, the distinguished database professor at, at oh, University sorry. of Maryland. I didn't <laughs> All right. realize and that. It just says AD. <laughs> All right. So uh, we allow users to configure this value, this number of additional uh, links in the in the configuration of collections, but by default we just use the same amount as the original graph have, and. Uh, Overall, it's it's not usually a big problem because, as I mentioned, those links are, are being deduplicated. So if if some links exist in original graph, it won't be explicitly added on top of this in in this in, after the merge process. That's the first thing. Second thing, overall, HNSW have a special heuristic which allows to exclude redundant nodes on its own. So even if you try to configure HNSW with, let's say, 1,000 neighbors for each node, it won't actually build graph with 1,000 neighbors because of this heuristic, okay. which will just prune uh, redundancy. It's, 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 yeah, it's not included into my slides, but it exists there. Just for right, simplicity, I, I, I try to avoid this like very deep <laughs> descriptions of which is that one. Thanks. Avery, you want to go next? Uh, yeah, sure. So I want to ask uh, how do you think of like uh, HNSW plus computation uh, compared with the scale? As we all know, like currently, basically also have some uh, version support uh, filtering. Uh, sorry, I, I didn't get the question. Maybe she, 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 she's asking, how does like your approach with HNS HNSW plus the quantization compare with uh, Microsoft's disk A and N? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, thanks. So. As far as I understand this kind of implementation, it doesn't use quantization in the first place. So the, the idea of this kind of is that you have uh, a data structure, like similar to HNSW, but without any hierarchy. So it's uh, a plain graph, much like uh, I have on my, on my slides here. Uh, and uh, the difference is not exactly in how you uh, search in this graph, but rather how you build it. So HNSW assumes that when you uh, insert a new point, you just uh, create a new links for this point in, in the existing graph. But uh, this kind of implementation, on the other hand, it it works in other direction. It builds a fully connected graph and then prune it. And I, I'm, I may be wrong here, but as I understood, this kind of is something like this. So this kind of doesn't, doesn't use any kind of uh, quantization, doesn't have like in memory storage. And actually, if you think about it uh, uh, here, there is no limitation on like which kind of uh, uh, indexing algorithm we are going to use. We can use this quantization plus oversampling uh, thing uh, with this kind of approach as well. So it's it's something on top of uh, vector index. It's agnostic to vector index type. All right, uh, Alessandro has a question. Uh, yes, uh, well, first of all, thank you for your talk. Um, my question is uh, from the point of view also of a possible user of your application, so not so much technical in the details of uh, the engine. Uh, I can get it for uh, image and uh, maybe text. 
but uh, do you have experience with uh, time series data? So maybe to check the similarities within time series and the, what are the challenges in this field, if uh, there are any? Yeah, so, uh, well, quadrant, in quadrant, we uh, do not exactly work with uh, embeddings. Quadrant assumes that embeddings are ready-made from some external model. Uh, so I, I would like this, this short answer to your question is if you have a model which can uh, translate uh, time series data into vector, then it's going to work uh, with quadrant as well. A bit longer answer to this question is probably going to involve like uh, it's going to depend on what type of, of time series that data you can you have and how how can you work with it. The most uh, the common thing which is uh, which I have experienced with and which is a bit closer to time series than just text is uh, uh, user uh, uh, events or user user behavior patterns. So, for example, if you have uh, a history of user transactions in like a ban ban banking system or something like this, you can build a model which tries to predict next transaction and it can do this prediction through the vector embedding. So basically you will have uh, a model which can represent a series of actions uh, as a vectors and uh, and events in, in the system will also be, be vectors. So it's it's very close to, for example, how word to vec wor works. word to vec tries to predict mm -hmm. next word in the sentence. In the same way, we can train a model which can pre pre predict next event in a sequence. So we can use mm -hmm. these vectors from this model in uh, in quadrant and in, in vector search. Okay, right. thank you. One last question. Uh, so this is the question I'm going to ask all the speakers this uh, this semester. In your opinion, what's the biggest unsolved problem you face in your system? Like if you had a magic wand to fix one thing, what would that be? In our system, uh, making it cheap to serve billion vectors. That's, that's one thing like our, our milestone for the engineering team, I guess, for the next year. So right now it's it's quite expensive. You need to have, even, even with binary quantization and stuff like this, you still need to have uh, a lot of memory it, it have a lot of problems with this uh, random access and so on. So our main challenge is to make it cheaper. 